So our next speakers are beloved friends of ours, uh, Tasha and Kenton Bailey. They helped start this church. Uh, they've been with us before the beginning. Um, they're still on our leadership team to this day. And they have a powerful story, a powerful testimony. And out of that powerful testimony, God gave them uh, a powerful teaching, uh, which has brought a lot of healing to them and their marriage. And uh, they felt led to share that and do a small group on that before we even were talking about this conference. And they've been talking about that and working on that. And then when we planned the conference, it was very obvious, like, you should share your story and, and do a teaching on that and help lead people through what you've been through um, because God gave them a process for, for healing and how to work through things and truly experience healing uh, in a profound way. And, uh, and so that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to steal any thunder. Um, and so would you guys join me in welcoming Tasha and Kenton Bailey. Awesome. feel like we're showing our age with our paper notes up here. I'm most nervous about mounting this seat in front of you. I just, the content I'm cool with. It's like getting up here though. I'm like, oh, if I fall, that's going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just going to open this up in prayer before we start. God, I just thank you for um, your presence here today and for the work that you're doing in us. And we just ask for um, an open heaven over us today and that you would just come and um, invade our spaces and that you would just set us apart and mark us this weekend. That um, you would bring freedom and healing in our relationships and in our families. And God, we just thank you in advance for um, doing that for us. And God, just guide our um, time right now and our words and just use it all for your glory. And we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so Aaron already took care of the, uh, the introductions. Um, if anybody doesn't know us, that's who we are. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've been married um, 17 years, same as the Kirks, 17 glorious years. Um, yeah, so Tasha's going to... Uh, later go through some of the um, revelation that that we've received out of our story um, and and really do some teaching on that and but before that I'm gonna share our story which is kind of weird because I'm not a storyteller <laughs> um, she's the storyteller that's right. I, when, whenever I'm asked to speak, I go through the whole Moses thing of, God, I, I'm not a good talker. <laughs> and God's like, who, who made your mouth? <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Who's your daddy? <laughs> oh, That's man. What he says. But anyway, so yeah. I'm going to go through a very uh, kind of high-level um, backstory to, to set up everything else. Um, so our story starts in fourth grade is where we met. Um, yeah, so we went to the uh, Adams County Christian School. Um, I had gone there my whole life, and she, she came in fourth grade. And so she came in. She was the new girl, so she had the, the new girl mystique and, and <laughs> caught my attention. I smelled of vanilla fields. As a, 
don't know about that. Trust me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, as a fourth grader, she caught my attention. I'm not sure that I knew what girls were at the time, but, um, yeah, we, we had a very small class, small school, so there were typically less than 10 in our class, so we were very close, um, always with each other. Uh, but early on, um, I, I did the, the thing that you do when you're that young, and I had my older sister <laughs> <laughs> talk to Tasha and ask her if she would be my girlfriend. <laughs> and she said yes. Was that fourth grade? Yeah. So we were in fourth. Because I didn't know you. I was like, yeah, who's your brother? Yeah. <laughs> So we were in fourth grade. So I don't know what being boyfriend, girlfriend means in fourth grade. Um, it didn't really change anything. I think we held hands once or twice. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, but so we, we went through grade school kind of, kind of together. Uh, there came a point, though, where she believed that I was too immature for her, and so she broke up, which it's, it's a valid feeling, I think, <laughs> for, for any seventh grade boy. I mean, you just get more immature as you, as you age. Uh, so she moved on to older, more mature guys, um, which again didn't change much with us. We were still <laughs> we were still good friends. We were still around each other all the time, and um, I think over those few years we kind of had a um, an unspoken agreement that even if we weren't together, we were supposed to be together, mm -hmm. and we kind of grew up like that. Um, we were always just a thing, whether we were officially a thing or not. Um, but the cool thing about those experiences is all of my um, coming-of-age moments in life, like when I realized girls didn't have cooties <laughs> and <laughs> things like that, she was always the, the object of my affection. Like, she was the one that... Um, first gave me those feelings, I guess, which is just a cool thing to have my wife. I have those memories with my wife. But um, We went through school, and um, when we were juniors in high school, we both went to community college, so we kind of got separated a little bit then, um, didn't see each other as much. Um, I think there was a time in there we were in community college where she um, <laughs> she asked me to come and help her with with math because she was struggling with math. And I was not struggling with math. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, yep, yeah, I like math. Math is good. <laughs> and so I would go to her house and uh, <laughs> we would work work on math. He worked on math. Well, it was I'm it's like, important why to are know you, math. I'm not, I, you're here for the math. I am not here for the math. It's very... Um, and yeah. he literally was like, lose equations. I'm like, what about us? I thought it was a travesty that she couldn't, couldn't do this math. <laughs> and she needed to learn it. Some people know what I'm talking about. It's <laughs> not me. But yeah, she did. That's not what she was hoping for. And <laughs> I was... I was uh, oblivious. oblivious, hard to receive, hard-headed, um, so it kind of died off. I think you eventually gave up. Um, I did, because you so chose we, math. <laughs> it's important. We, we went on about our business um, through community college and graduated. We went to... We went to the same college, but we never saw each other. We were in completely different fields. She was not in math. <laughs> <laughs> and I was. <laughs> it's true. 
So we really never saw each other through, <laughs> through college. Um, and we were with, with other people throughout. And, uh, but we always, like I said, we always just had this, um, or at least I did, this thing in my head that like she was for me. Even, even if I wasn't with her, she was, she was with me. Um, that sounds so creepy. <laughs> she was with me. Even if she didn't know it, she was with me. <laughs> Dang it. With the beard and everything, too. Yeah, it's just... I know. It's a thing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we graduated college and moved on, started doing our post-college things like adults do. And um, in 2004, at the end of 2004, after, I think the week after Christmas, um, partly due to divine intervention, yeah. and but mostly a setup from our moms, yeah. I um, found myself driving to Tasha's family's house to drop something off. It was like an air cleaner mm -hmm. for some reason. And I was like, oh, that's strange, but okay. So I'm driving there, not thinking much about it, and I don't think she was even home at the time. And um, so her mom called her, and she's like, "Hey, Kenton's coming to our house. You might want to come." And so she stopped what she was doing and and came to her house, and it was totally a setup, looking back, but I didn't know that at the time. So I dropped the thing off and I think did I stay for dinner that night it was weird you did it was weird yeah um stayed for dinner and then we ended up talking for a couple of hours mm -hmm. after that and it was just a how's your life how's your life and we both decided not great and we decided that night to get married <laughs> after not after not being together for so many years we were like once you know you know uh, yeah which we'd always known like i said and it, it was just i th i think it was time it yeah. was like all right we're going to do this yeah um but we were we were both with other people at the time so it took <laughs> yeah yeah, that was tough. Yeah. It's a weird thing. But he was so honorable because we were, it was like pouring down yeah. rain and we were talking through, through this. I'm like, are you happy? No. Are you happy? No. It was like a movie. We're going to be together. We got to break up with people. <laughs> and he was so honorable. He like didn't even touch me at all. He was like, it was so pure from the beginning. And that's when I knew, like, oh, this is the real deal, because he's not here for anything other than... Math and... <laughs> and that air cleaner. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Mm. Yeah, so it, it took a week to free ourselves up <laughs> to be able to officially say that we were together. Um, but we did it, so we started, that was in December, we started dating in January, and then I think February we confessed our love for each other. Which we had already picked out rings. <laughs> our our first date, we shopped for rings. Yes, we did. Yep. Um, then in April, we got engaged, and then started planning the wedding, and in November, we got married, so it was quick. It's quick, but we knew. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we had our our fairy tale wedding, um, our Disney wedding. It wasn't at Disney. I was re referring to Aaron's talk. Um, and then, much about Disney now. Yeah, not it's Disney's different. <laughs> um, yeah, and then a dream honeymoon. And came back, and it was like, it's kind of like the feeling of when you bring home your first baby. You get, you get home, and you're like, whoa, now what? <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you do with this? We're adults. Um, and we lived happily ever after. <laughs> no. 
That's pretty much it. <laughs> We're done. No, it's not true. Um, yeah, I think the, the fairy tale ended pretty soon after that. <laughs> after we got home from, from our honeymoon mm -hmm. and we started being adults and living life and um, trying to become one, you know, which is how, how we're designed. We, we quickly figured out that each of us brought in a bunch of junk <laughs> to, our, to our marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and it was stuff that I think on our own we could cover and stuff down and hide. Um, and then once we got married and we started doing life together, it's like, oh, this stuff is coming out. Yeah. Um, and she had stuff she brought in and... And I had stuff I brought in, but our story, this part of our story is about the stuff that I brought in. And what I brought in was um, an addiction to pornography. And it started for me when I was a mid-teenager. Um, it was the mid-90s, so it was like internet was just becoming common in, in houses and I think, at least I like to think, I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplifying it. I, I think it, it started out for me as somewhat of a, like an innocent um, curiosity, I would say. Um, but then it, it quickly morphed and evolved um, and looking back on it, I think some of it was, it turned into like a, a thrill of the hunt for it. I don't know if those are the right words, but um, it was kind of a rush, maybe. And also looking back, I think it had a lot less to do with what I was looking at than it did with um, the idea of it or the, the feeling that I got, the, the rush that I got, or even, even a little bit of a rebellion um, because I grew up in a, a Christian home and, and went to church my whole life and, and I had this um, identity of a, a good Christian boy. And I think pornography became a, a thing that I could do that was like a, a separate life, and I and I compartmentalized it, and I could still keep this facade where people on the outside saw me, and they still <laughs> they still saw a good Christian boy, and um, but I had this other life that um, was separate, and so it it became a habit. Um, and I didn't, I didn't understand or, or have the language for it at the time, but um, it turned into a stronghold. And it was definitely something, I think it, you know, later on in my teen years, it's some, it, it was an addiction. It was something I, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. Um, I just didn't have the, the strength to stop it. It was something that I, um, that was comfortable that I fell back to, um, kind of an escapism device. Um, yeah, and it was, I think um, at that time, the, the culture I grew up in and, and even the, the churches I grew up in, the normal thing to do with a sin was to hide it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not talk about it. And the worst thing that could happen is people find out about it and your cover is blown and um, people see you differently. And so that's what I did. And that's, that's what, I mean, I became good at it. I could, I could look at things I shouldn't one second and then be at, be at church and um, volunteering in church the next. And it, 
I, I just became good at it. And so coming into our marriage, I, I think I always thought that marriage was like the solution for it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because it, it is a, a sin that's driven by a sexual drive. I thought, oh, once I get married, I'll have the real thing and, you know, that'll fill my need for it. Um, so once we got married, it was like, okay, yeah, it, it worked how I thought for a while. <laughs> it, it was the, the whole newness thing is like everything changed in life. So it was easy to, to stop a habit for a while. Um, but it didn't last long. I mean, the, the newness of everything wears off quick and... Um, you grow up and you're, you're being an adult and things get old and you fall back on what's comfortable and what you know. And, and so that's what I did. Um, and obviously the same thing, I carried on. It's like, I, well, I can't let her know this. I can't let anybody else know this. Um, so I hit it. Um, I'm gonna make sure I hit the notes that I want to talk about. Yeah, so I think maybe two years into our marriage, um, she found out about it. And it was a major, <laughs> a major life changing event. Um, and it was, it was hard. There was lots of brokenness. Um, I think I lost your trust during that time, and um, we didn't know we didn't know the things we know now about healing. Um, we weren't surrounded by the people that we are now, and we were kind of alone in it. And so I think we tried to handle it the only way we knew how, which was basically big blow up. Um, lots of hard conversations, but then try to move on and forget about the feelings that never got healed. And my job was to try to have enough willpower not to do it again. Um, so we moved on from there, you know, me trying to, to fix my problems on my own, not really talking about the hurt that Tasha had, and we spent years like that, <clears throat> and so there again, it was like, oh, I'm going to remember this hurt from this moment, and it's going to be enough to keep me from going back to it, and it was for a while, mm -hmm. and then you, I fell back into it, mm -hmm. and it became a cycle. Um, where I would be victorious over it for a time, and then I would fail, and then shame and guilt, which just led to, to more hiddenness, because <laughs> in my head I was linking, oh, if, if anybody knows, that's pain, it's painful. So the best thing to do is, is hide. So it, it was a totally separate life, um, a separate part of my life that was not shared with, with Tasha. And um, Yeah, I want to add real fast that during this time when, we, when I found out about the pornography addiction up until you know, years later, during that time, we were deeply disconnected and our relationship was um surface intimacy it i mean we still mm -hmm. were we had great days i mean it wasn't like all horrible but we weren't here's the thing okay pornography is a big deal so if you're sitting here and you're like oh pornography is not that big of a deal it's like a real person no your soul tie 
happens to each image that you look at when you're looking at pornography. So what happens in your brain is you associate all these different people with the feeling that you should have from your spouse. And so your brain, it's your brain, your brain starts to exercise false intimacy. And so even if, even, even if we wanted to be fully connected in under true intimacy during that time when he had gone back to looking at it, we couldn't because our souls were not tied under that three-strand cord. There were a lot of other cords that were vying for our, for our minds. So I went into hiding too. He's in hiding, I'm in hiding, as I'm protecting myself because even though I don't know that the addiction is still happening for sure, my soul knew. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we couldn't practice true intimacy. And, and I wanna say that I brought in soul ties to our marriage with other men. And so when I brought in those soul ties to our marriage, he brings in soul ties to all these images. There was like no way that we were gonna have a healthy, true, deep, intimate, soul tied connection under our marriage vow. Like it, so we both were in hiding during this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, that's something we, that's something I figured out through the healing process was, uh, again, it was not so much um, the act of what I was doing or what I was looking at that was the thing that kept me going to it. It was, it was, um, it was the false intimacy mm -hmm. to where. I felt like I could go there and there was no risk. Yeah. There was no risk of rejection that you have in a marriage. Um, because true intimacy is risky. Yeah. It's so scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, I was believing so many lies that the enemy was throwing at me that, that kept me there. Um, mm -hmm. Like... It's only hurting me. It's not affecting my wife. Um, it has nothing to do with my wife. Um, the worst thing that can happen is she finds out because that will destroy her and it will be years to rebuild. The best thing to do is to keep it hidden and someday I'll be able to overcome it. And so those, those were the... Like, I knew that's not the case in my head, but those were the things I was believing because that's what the enemy wanted me to believe. That's what keeps me in hiding um, and from freedom. Yeah. So, yeah, we, I, I mean, that went on for, for years, and that became my greatest fear in life. Like, every day I feared her finding out, <laughs> and I lived like that. I mean that it set the tone for our lives at that at that time. So I think eventually I know eventually God decided it was enough um, <laughs> and that I wasn't going to do what I know I needed to do, so he stepped in. Amen. Um, so yeah, one day I was I was at work, and I, Tasha had some friends over hanging out and um, looking back, it was a, another total setup that God made happen, but um, I got a call, or I, I was in a meeting and I started getting texts from her, and they were like emergency, like SOS texts, and I, for, I, I don't remember exactly what they said, but I knew it was Color. something was up, and Colorful. Because I constantly lived in that fear, I instantly went to, oh, she's found, she's found something um, somehow. And so I, I just, my stomach just sank. Um, but I'm in a meeting. I'm like, hey, I'm in a meeting. Is this an emergency? And I think she texted back something like, well, if, if you want to stay married to me, <laughs> I need you to call me. <laughs> so I got out of the meeting and called, and, and she explained um, that she found everything. 
Um, and I say it's a total, it was a total setup because she is um, not tech savvy. And <laughs> I mean, I can't do math. I she can't, can't do phone. She's not. That's what I'm for. It is. Thank you. But she, her, the way she fixes a problem on her phone is typically by like <laughs> smacking it until it works. And I, and I say that because it's that true. that day her phone quit working for some reason, for some reason. Um, and instead of just waiting until I got home, she tried to fix it herself. So she was trying to like restore it. And in doing so, somehow she restored my phone to her phone. And so everything that was on my phone was then on her phone. And she started looking and started finding everything that I had been looking at and obviously was just mortified. And um, so that's what, that, that was the setup. Um, when she told me that, I knew, like, oh, God just did this. Um, so I left work and started driving home. And I, I remember the whole time I was so mad at God because, like, he knew that this was the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> My God, I know this. I know you know this. She can't find this out. And you just set me up. And I just remember being so mad that he did it. Um, and that was a long drive home. I just remember thinking all of the possibilities of what's, what's going to happen when I get home. It was like best case scenario was same as before. It's going to be crushing and, and take years of trying to repair. And then like worst case is she's going to leave me, um, which was a very fair possibility. Um, or she might kill me. I don't know. <laughs> it, or at least physically harm me, which may have happened. So I got home, and we somehow got rid of our kids. I think God took our kids away for a month. Oh. So I got home, and there, there, was, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was a time period of the normal human emotions that uh, I expected, but it was a very short time, uh, maybe an hour or so. I said a lot. I don't curse in my real life or even in my head. I need to tell. I need to confess. I wasn't going to say this, but I. I said cuss words. She may have hit me. I, I didn't know you I did? hit you. Oh, it felt like she hit me. <laughs> I hit you with my string of cuss words, like. Pew. That's how strong they were because you weren't used to hearing them from me. So it yeah. probably felt like a smack, or it was literally God they're, smacking you. Could they're useful. Could have been that. Useful at times, I guess. Only that time. That I do time. not condone cussing. <laughs> I don't. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was ugly for, for a little while. Um, and then something, something broke yes. in Tasha, I felt. Yes. And then what I experienced from then on was nothing short of a, a rescue plan from God and, and like just a, a loving father who had lost a son. Um, and then a, a wife that somehow against her will <laughs> submitted to the Holy Spirit in the moment and even, I, I mean, she was verbally saying, I do not want to do this, but the Spirit is leading me. And we spent the next several hours, it's kind of hard to explain and put words to, but um, the Holy Spirit became our counselor in that time. And it was as real as if we were in the room with, with a human counselor but that person actually made us and <laughs> knew us intimately. And he began to walk us through, step by step, what we were supposed to do. Um, not just words or feelings. Like, physically, 
he told us what to do step by step. And everyone, Tasha was like, I do not want to do this. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit's telling me to do this. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, we were desperate. Like, we were yeah, desperate we were broken. for his touch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to just walk through some of the things that happened that night. Um, but then Tasha's going to talk more about that and the significance of each thing. Um, yeah, so the, I think the first thing that we did after the normal human emotions was confession. And, man, we probably spent an hour, I just confessed everything that I could think of that I had done that was a sexual sin against my wife and against God. And it was painful and ugly, and it was all the stuff that I had spent my whole life trying to hide um, and all the things that I am the least proud of in my life. And I just got everything out that I could think of. Um, and that was hard, hard for her, too. Um, hard for her to listen to. But, like I said, she was submitted to the Holy Spirit somehow. Um, so after that, I think after that, she led me in a, a safe place prayer, which... If you've never done or never heard of, it's, it's, I think God uses your imagination to come into kind of the spiritual realm and interact with him. Um, and I was kind of skeptical of all that at first because I'd never been able to do it. Um, but it became very real to me then. And it was not just a, a mental or imaginary thing. It, there was some physical things that happened. Um, but she, she led me in it, and, and I came into the presence of Jesus, and I gave Jesus all of my stuff, my junk, and he took it from me. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Just give me a second. And... Uh, <clears throat> So that that's when I that's when my my mind changed about a safe place prayer because um, he embraced me and I could physically feel things leaving. Um, yeah, and I I spent a long time on the floor just in that state. <laughs> And during that time, I was both angry because he was getting all this freedom. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what about me, God? I've, I've been offended. And that's not God's heart. That wasn't his heart. Yeah. I think from that, from that time on, I was, I was changed. Um, and I think God sovereignly healed me, like right then Amen. and there. Um, I know that's what happened. And then you led me through some deliverance yeah. from it, some prayer that just set me free even more. Um, and then the Holy Spirit continued to walk her through, this is what you need to do now. And she again said, I don't want to do this, but I'm supposed to wash your feet. And so we went in and she washed my feet, which is just, this whole thing was the most humbling experience I've ever, <laughs> I've ever had, but the most uh, freeing and, and joyful at the same time. Um, I forget if there are any other specific things. Um, but then at some point, Tasha felt like God was telling her that we needed physical connection, physical intimacy, which I know was the farthest thing from what you wanted to do at the time. 
Um, and he specifically told her, like, I want you to be intimate, physically intimate with him every day for 30 days. 30 days. And so she's like, God, please don't make me do this. I do not like him right now. Like, even on a good day, I'm like, God, please don't. That sounds exhausting. That. <laughs> it was exhausting, actually. But we did it. We did. It might have been more than 30 days. <laughs> Oh, man. I am so embarrassed. Sometimes more than once a day. Stop! Stop! <laughs> That's what God told us to do. Oh, my gosh. Just following, following the Spirit. This no, is but... why he doesn't talk. It's true. No, but there, it's funny. It's funny to talk about, but there was a reason God told her to do that. Um, and it's... <laughs> I'm going to pass out. It's because he knows us, and he knows how, we're, how he created us, and he knows how we're wired, and he knows that my brain had physically been wired a different way because I was bringing other people into our marriage by looking at images and he knows that if we spent 30 days rewiring. rewiring by only physically connecting with each other, that would be our new, yes. our new normal. Um, it would return us to how he created us to, to look at and to love one person. And to associate that yeah. feeling with yeah. each other and cancel all demonic assignments that had been placed on us yeah, and so that we had partnered with. All, all of the rush, um, the dopamine that we chase and so many things would get rewired to her. Now I associate that with her. And it, it worked, and it was good. Um, it was good. What? Just move on. It's part of my notes. <laughs> so I, f I feel like at that, at that point, we didn't completely understand it, or I didn't. But I think, I know, I, was, I got filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. And it was one of my first... Um, <laughs> it was your buddy Ryan. <laughs> Dying. It was one of my first experiences with that. And so the next month or more, we were just led by the Spirit in everything we did. And Our communication. Yeah. And I don't speak words well. And, and <laughs> her, Tell me about it. And, and, and her love language is words of affirmation, words in general. Mm -hmm. And that's always been a struggle. And I remember every day... God telling me what to say. Like, he would literally tell me what to say to her. I would say it, and she would melt into a puddle. And I was like, this is awesome. It's like, I'm so romantic. <laughs> but that's what it was. We were, we were both led by the Spirit. And um, there was a time of reconnection, and we were just new creations. It was like we had a new marriage that we had never experienced. Yeah, and during that time, it was important to be, commu be in communication deeply with each other because I could say, like, oh, what you, this thing that you did or said today is a trigger for me, and it, and it makes me feel like I can't trust you or I'm not safe with you. And he was in a place of total, complete humility where he could say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Let me poke some holes in that for you because that's not how I meant how I meant it. And up until that point, up until we call it the great rescue, up until the rescue, I wouldn't have said, oh, what you're doing hurts me because I couldn't, I couldn't take my armor off long enough to expose 
um, vulnerability to him because we weren't soul tied. We were in true intimacy. So we're, we've got to get busy. Yeah, we were almost out of time. Um, so yeah, to try and leave Tasha some time to go through other things we've learned, I just want to say, since we've been on this side of this struggle, um, I've realized how common it is in Christians, mostly men, but women are not exempt, um, to be involved in, in looking at pornography. And I think it's a, a lot of it's because we don't talk about it. Yeah. You know, we, we create a culture of keeping it hidden, and um, so it never gets revealed and brought out into the light. Um, but with how common it is, and this many people in a room, I can almost guarantee that somebody here struggles with it. Um, it's just statistics. It's math, you know? <laughs> but yeah, for the sake of time, I just want to say if, if speaking to those people, if there's somebody here that is caught in it and struggling with it, um, you're probably believing a lot of those same lies that, that I talked about. And I just want to say those are total lies. They're not true. They're not the truth at all. Um, and because I know how it is to believe those lies deep down, um, I'll be blunt and harsh and say that looking at pornography is cheating on your spouse. Like, Absolutely. It is um, adultery. Yeah. And that was... I think she said that to me, like when I got home, um, and we started talking, and it was just like, oh, the weight of it. Um, that's not something that you're gonna. That's not a conclusion you're gonna come to on your own if you're hiding it and you're doing it. Um, but that's what it is, and and there is no way for you to have a close, intimate relationship <laughs> with your spouse if you're looking at pornography. It's just not gonna happen. You may think it, you may believe the lies that say it's not affecting your marriage, but it is. And it's not just affecting your marriage, it's affecting you, it's affecting your relationship with God, it's affecting your relationship with your friends. I figured out, after, after my healing, it was like I had all new friends. They're the same people, but <laughs> I'd never experienced them like that before. Um, Thanks. <laughs> but yes, it, it is a serious, serious thing. And when we, whenever we talk to couples that are, you know, having marriage problems or whatever, it's like the first thing that we bring up. It's like, are you looking at pornography? <laughs> Step one, are you looking at pornography? Because if, if you are, then nothing else you're trying to do to improve your marriage is going to work. It's just not. Um, so it's serious and it needs to be dealt with and God doesn't want it for you and he wants freedom for you um, the blood speaks a better word yes. mm. than that um, and <clears throat> once you decide that you're done and it's, it's time to get free everybody's not going to experience the same thing that we experienced the same way we did um, Pretty much everything that happened with us happened to me, and I had not much to do with it. And I'm not proud of the fact that I had to get caught <laughs> to get out of it. Um, but that's what happened to me, and that's my story. Um, but you don't have to get caught to do it, yeah. and you don't have to experience the same thing that we did. And the, the Bible's full of examples of how to get free from it. Um, and it's you know a few steps, confession, to your spouse, like you, you have to tell your spouse what you've been doing, and it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done, uh, but you can't skip that step. You have to do it. It brings your sin out into the light, um, uncovers it. It's no longer hidden. Um, confession. Repentance. You have to, you know, it's a churchy word, but 
It means stop what you're doing and turn to God. And you may say, well, if I could stop what I was doing, I would have stopped. But you can stop long enough to turn to God. That's right. Like, <laughs> you can stop for a week, turn to God, and chase after him. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it's like if, if all of us are, were chasing after God the way that we need to be, you would be free from habitual practiced sin. <laughs> if you're 100% focused on God, all of that stuff is going to leave, whether you, that was your intention or not. Um, what else? So th- uh, this may be a stronghold that, that you can't get over with those things, and you may need deliverance. Um, you may need outside help. And if that's the case, if it's something you feel you just can't get rid of, talk to somebody on our ministry team, and you can get a session set up with somebody who can walk through it with you and pinpoint things in your life that you need healed from. Um, further, like... Also, you have authority over it. So yeah. you can you can pray some holy fire down on somebody. Yep. All y'all. <laughs> Yeah, so, oh, we just got more time. I know, it's like magic. Boom. Okay, so, yeah, if, if somebody out here is like, that's me, I struggle with that, and you're comfortable, come and talk to me after. We can pray through it and talk about what to do next. Um, but, yeah, sometime after all of that, we started getting revelation. I say we, I mean mostly Tasha. Started getting revelation about the things that God led us through and why and a bunch of stuff. But I'm going to let her talk about that. Thanks. You did great. So when after all of this happened and we're trying to heal from it, I was so frustrated at the lack of Christian material that didn't call for accountability partners. Because accountability partner is like, oh, it's going to happen again. What do we do when it does? And we weren't about that life. We wanted everlasting change. We wanted full and complete healing. We wanted to never look back. And only to, sh- only to use it as a testimony, but never, ever, ever to encounter the sin again. And so I just, I just, man, I was so frustrated because what I found was um, not what I sensed that the, the Holy Spirit wanted for our healing. And so I just, over the course of those 30, 40 days, the Lord just gave me revelation as I studied through um, Luke. And, um, and I'll tell you, um, it helped me make sense of all the things that, do you need this open anymore? Um, it helped me make things make sense of all the things that the Lord had led me to do that night of our rescue, um, and uh, and so I want to share that with you tonight or today, um, because I realized when I was studying the Word of God that we are created in the likeness of Jesus Christ, and in the likeness of Jesus we have a responsibility to model His life. And um, when I started to think about Jesus' final days on the earth um, and study that, I realized that he went through a massive betrayal. And you don't have to be sitting here today with with sexual immorality in your marriage or, you know, whatever. It can be any type of betrayal, really. Um, Any type of betrayal that comes between you and your spouse um, or... It's anything that puts a wedge between the sacred covenant vow of true intimacy. And so um, I started looking at the life of Jesus, and I'm going, man, he set the pure model for what healing should look like. And, um, and so I, I put a, a timeline together of eight, eight practical things that... Jesus walked through in his final days, and it was the betrayal, and I'll unpack these a little bit more, the betrayal, the cleansing, the offering, the grieving, the forgiving, the letting go, the resurrecting, 
and the awakening. And those were the, those were the steps that I watched Jesus take in his word. And I thought, if we need, we need healing, we need everlasting healing in our marriage and true freedom. So this is the way of God. <laughs> this is the way of God. So um, I wrote it all down. And I knew when the Lord gave it to me that we would have to share our, share our story one day because that's what he does with ashes. And um, that was scary leading this day, this week. I'm going to tell you, leading up to this weekend, Satan tried to take me out, literally tried to take me out. One of the hardest weeks of my life, and I'm not, I'm not making that up. And when we were singing this morning, this is how I fight my battles, I was thinking, this is how we fight our battles. What we're doing today is a direct arrow to the face of Satan. Um, we're, right now, we're, by sharing this, we are, we are disarming um, shame. We're disarming uh, hiddenness. We're disarming um, anything that the enemy can hold over our heads. Um, and we're inviting you to join us. <laughs> So it's like a double whammy, <laughs> you know? It's like, um, I'm really excited because, yeah, I feel like I've got my bow and arrow out and I'm just, yes. uh, uh, just taking them out. That's how I feel. I'm so hyped. Okay, so um, he, I want to read, I have a lot of scripture, Hebrews 1, 2 through 3. Um, if you're taking notes, Hebrews 1, 2 through 3. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And this is, this is the life of Jesus Christ. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. We are. We have to establish that we are created in the image of God. Jesus is the, the lightness of God. We are the lightness of God. And so we carry the responsibility to follow in the healing footsteps of Jesus Christ. Not just healing, but the, the, the victorious footsteps of Jesus Christ. And um, since we are made in the image of Jesus, we carry the DNA, uh, the kingdom DNA. It's in our very fibers. The kingdom DNA is uh, who we are, and it's how we present ourselves in the likeness of Jesus, doing just as he did, just as the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. That's John 5, 19. Um, and so I started considering that if our fundamental design is to follow the life and person of Jesus, what better model to look at when healing and restoring the, the ruptures in your marriage um, than to the sacred union of Jesus Christ to his beloved church, you and me. Um, and so we read in Ephesians 5, uh, 22 through 33. I won't read the, the whole passage, but it's in that passage where um, we see that relationship as parallel of Christ to his church and husbands to their, to their wives. We, are, um, we have a model to look toward, and I thank Jesus so much that he's given us that model, especially when we need to bring our marriages under um, the new covenant. You may think, and today you may be sitting here thinking or be fully convinced that your marriage is at the end of the three-stranded cord you thought could never be broken. Um, or you've already made the hard, the hard conversations of getting past the confession. Um, or you may be sitting here thinking that your marriage is fine, but um, there's a confession that needs to happen. Or you've worked through it 
and you're sitting here completely redeemed and restored, and you're living to tell about it, you know, and so, um, and so uh, you may feel, but you may be feeling desperate, hurt, betrayed, or angry, a host of other emotions, um, preparing for an end of a covenant promised, but new life waits on the other side of a life modeled after Jesus's final hours on the earth as a man waiting for the end, but preparing for a promised covenant that would radically transform the bride of Christ for all eternity. And that same transformation is available for us and for our marriages. So um, we're going to unpack part one, and that's the betrayal. Um, before Jesus went into the upper room with his, his disciples, he already knew about the betrayal. He knew about Peter's upcoming betrayal. He knew about Judas's upcoming betrayal. Um, he was well informed <laughs> of what was going on behind his back. Um, let's get something straight. Like, there is no behind Jesus's back. <laughs> it's like, He's everything. And so Matthew 26, 14 through 16 talks about um, Judas Iscariot. Uh, Iscar Come on. Iscariot. Thanks. Why can't I get that out just now? This is the gum. Um, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Um, and then they, so they counted out 30 pieces of silver. Um, and then Judas, it says, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And so the betrayal begins. Mark 14, 15 says, and he will show you a large upper room furnished. We're, we're heading. So Judas makes his agreements. He exchanges um, his beloved Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And then um, Jesus calls for them to prepare the upper room. Uh, later in verses 17 and 18, and when it was evening, he came with the 12, and as they were reclining at the table eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. It's one who's eating with me. And I don't know if you've ever sat across the dinner table at one who has betrayed you. It is not a pretty place to be. It is painful. But Jesus still showed up. Um, Mark 14, 29 through 30 says that Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I'm not going to. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So again, Jesus knew. After realizing a marital betrayal against the sacred covenant vow of your, of your marriage covenant, the offense must meet the life of Jesus because... He is God's sacred covenant vow to his people. That's how you heal. You meet the life of Jesus. That's everlasting healing. That's why I'm sitting beside my husband today who was radically delivered the night of the rescue and has not been tempted one more time with pornography because we killed it that day. We put it under the blood that day. We didn't say, oh, this could happen again. Let's put up all these, you know, boundaries over everything. And when we walk by Victoria's Secret, hide your eyes. And, you know, it, it's like you'd be hiding your eyes everywhere in our culture today. I can't even watch commercials. And so that's not the answer. It's a heart condition. It's a heart posture. And so we weren't looking for bandages um, we were looking for everlasting change. Boundaries are not bad things. No, though. boundaries are and the guardrails we, we, we of intimacy. <laughs> yes. We have put them up. I was, Absolutely. Matt was actually trying to fix something on my phone yesterday, and he was trying to delete an app, and I'm like, can't, can't delete apps off my phone. Tasha would have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Only a girl's got the power for that. <laughs> so, so guardrails are good. Guardrails are good because they are, Erica one time said, that guardrails are, the, or no, boundaries are the guardrails to intimacy. And that's absolutely true. But you, have, you can't be stupid. The guardrails, <laughs> that is not what brings your healing. No, no, that's, that's it. Yeah, boy. Um, so his life 
is the symbol, a holy sacrifice for kingdom reconciliation and ultimate forgiveness. And since we are made in his image for his purpose, our lives, again, must run parallel to his. Um, Yeah, we talked about soul ties already. When the sacred vow is ruptured, betrayal can often build a guardrail of pride rooted in hurt and fear, which you guys talked about today. Um, it's that fear down there at the root. And this can work against healing when you, put, when you clothe yourself in pride, but it's just, it's just a cover-up for the deep hurt and fear. But when you cover yourself up with pride, that works against your healing, and it works against reconciliation. Um, so for, the, you know, for both people, it's important that you create a safe, split, a safe space for confession, and that's just as important as the confession by itself, that you create a safe place for your spouse. <clears throat> and I did not do that at first, but the Lord graciously brought me out of cussing. <laughs> <laughs> and into safety. <laughs> and I did not hit him. We're gonna talk, <laughs> we are going to talk about that later. <laughs> Realizing a betrayal against the sacred marriage bed, a moral or sexual failure, right? Okay, it can be... Uh, I'm not, okay, I know. Uh, breaks the covenant vow, so in order to repair the rupture, we have to look to Jesus, who knew about Ju Judas and Peter. He knew they would both betray him, and yet he still showed up to the upper room. Jesus knew that even after all they had shared together, witnessing miracles, experiencing the truth of his identity as the Son of God, Judas and Peter would cower at the seductive voice of Satan, who would convince them to completely sell out under pressure. It's like... That's what Satan does. Um, yeah. And so he knew that 30 pieces of silver would be a cheap exchange for Jesus' life, a, a, a hollow transaction for false security. I mean, he just handed, he got 30 pieces of silver for what? False security? Yeah. Um, and he... And so he knew that he would be denied for every day. Jesus knew that he would be denied three times for every day his body would wait in a temporary tomb. You guys, that's good. <laughs> Denied three times, he waited in a temporary tomb three days. Three times of denial, three days in a temporary tomb for new life. And you know what? He still showed up to the upper room. And Jesus already knows where you've traded him for your own moments of silver. All y'all got silver. It came from somewhere. And I think one of the things in this first part is deciding where, what you traded for the silver. Um, yeah, so what does healing through part one look like? That looks like confession. Kenton already talked about it. Healing through part one is confession. You find out about the betrayal. Go through the confessing. Unpack it all. Don't leave anything out. It will be so painful if you have to come back a couple years later and go, oh, man, I forgot this one thing. Or, or that one thing is uncovered years later. Don't. Just get it all out right then and there. Because... Something Aaron said yesterday is that um, when he was removing shame from the room is that God doesn't bring this stuff up to shame you. He brings this stuff up to heal you and set you free. That's a good word. That's the truth. So get it out. And then while you're going through all that stuff, cut and bind off every soul tie that you brought into your marriage. If you're single, cut soul ties right now. And start preparing yourself for your husband or your wife. Um, and keep yourself pure. Um, just do that, please. Um, but cut off and bind all soul ties to each person that you were sexually active with before your marriage. And all pornographic images. You have to do that. You're not going to experience, if you're sitting here today and you're like, well, my marriage is pretty good, but I feel like, yeah, I do feel like kind of we're missing out on some, like, deep intimacy. Have you cut off soul ties to all these other people that you tried to wrap in your three-stranded cord? 
with the Lord, get rid of it and do it with your spouse. Get with them. Go, I, I renounce. I, you know, if you need that information, come and see us. Aaron and Erica, we can help you. Anybody, anybody on staff or leadership here on the prayer team, we know how to help you if you have questions about that. But break those soul ties so that you can be available for, for true intimacy. Part two is the cleansing. The cleansing. Uh, John 13, 1 through 5 talks about how um, Jesus is in the upper room. He's with his disciples. And um, he, during supper, when the devil, look, listen, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, again, we're reminded Judas is sitting there at the table with the heart of deception, and Jesus knows it. He laid aside, Jesus laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel and tied it around his waist, and then he poured the water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I lost it when I, when I was studying through Luke days after what had happened with us. And I was like, that's why. That's why I had to wash the feet of my offender. Um, Jesus, he says, for he knew he was to betray him. And Jesus said, not all of you are clean. And... Um, and then it, the verse drops down to 15 and says, Do you understand what I've done for you? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of another. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to, for you. Isn't that beautiful? I didn't want to wash Kenton's feet. I remember I was fully clothed, sitting in, on my knees in the bathtub, washing his feet. I was sobbing, and I kept saying, I don't want to do this. Lord, this is, it, it, I wanted to be angry. I wanted to lash out. I wanted to make him pay with my venom, my venomous words, like what he had done. And yet the Lord had me get low and wash his feet. The upper room became a place for intimacy and promise. Jesus and his disciples connected in that upper room despite the betrayal. But it was also a place of covenant humility. Again, Jesus knew that not everyone in the room would hold true to their sacred vow. He knew there were two in the room who had already made agreements and partnered with the enemy to, to betray his trust. And yet he went low, tied a towel around his waist, and took the place of a servant as he washed the feet of his dearest companions. And not only did Jesus demonstrate humility, but also a cleansing. It was a purifying that would cancel betrayal's path betrayal had no hold on jesus he was about he was about to he knew he was about to conquer death and sin for all time betrayal had no place but he would cleanse and purify and mark his men for a new beginning found in his unconditional love so as we continue to align our steps with his we must get low and wash the feet of our offenders the, the work of lasting reconciliation begins as we lay down our right to be offended. And it's hard. It's hard, but lasting reconciliation comes when we lay down our right to be offended and renounce immediately spirits of fear and pride. I renounce all spirits of fear and pride that are working in me right now toward, toward or, or against my reconciliation. Get rid of it. Don't mess around. Don't mess around with it. It'll just hinder the healing. Um, 1 Timothy 2.21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. And I'm sitting beside my husband today, who is a vessel for honorable use. <laughs> Set apart as holy. Useful to the master of this house, <laughs> ready for a good work. That's what the purifying does. That's what the cleansing does. That's what humility does. It's so beautiful. 
2 Timothy, or um, walking in brave humility leads us closer to the Father's design and being generous with our forgiveness, especially when it's completely undeserved by showing mercy and grace, reflects the glory of everything that God did through Jesus. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the cleansing, it's the purifying. When we give freely of ourselves, we also invite our offenders into freedom. Man, that's good. <laughs> Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Walk, and this is not, not Psalm 51. This is me now. Walking in true humility always leads to an encounter with the Father because his love always takes a victory over deep hurt, unmet expectations, devastating offenses his rule and reign is the model for justice we are living for his justice doesn't look like the world's justice in our rescue justice would have looked like me walking out losing my cool walking out and then who knows what the enemy would have won on all sorts of different levels but kingdom justice god's justice looks like today So what does healing through part two look like? <clears throat> uh, pray a cleansing prayer over your spouse and invite the Holy Spirit to bring the finished work of the cross over your marriage, past, present, and future, and bless your spouse. Get low, tie your towel around your waist, and take time to wash each other's feet. Literally, not just figuratively. If there's been a problem in your marriage that's keeping you from each other, get low. Wash each other's feet. And as you're washing, pray, pray a cleansing prayer over your marriage. And then I would also add to declare 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 over your spouse. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Declare that over them. It ends with, behold, the new has come. <sighs> Part three, the offering. Okay, so the offering happens, uh, Luke 22, 14 through 21. And this is where Jesus says I have to his disciples, in the, they're still in the upper room, that place of intimacy, promise, humility, um, lots of things going on in the spiritual realm. <laughs> And Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Despite the betrayal looming, he chooses to set a table with his disciples. Jesus sets the table for true intimacy. It's the whole point to exchange his body and blood for every single piece of the world that would throw on layers of pleasure and sell you a counterfeit lover. Don't pay 30 pieces of silver for a counterfeit lover when Jesus is sitting at the table offering you his blood and his body in exchange for who you are and everything you brought to the table. No counterfeit lover is going to satisfy that hunger. Jesus became the new covenant vow as a holy connection between us and the Father. He broke bread among his most trusted companions, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Remember me. Same with the cup. This is the new covenant of my blood. Every time you drink it, remember me. That, that was not just small talk among friends sitting at a table. That was eternity talking. And although Jesus knew the spirit of deception had come for Judas and Simon Peter, he offered himself as the atonement for their sin in exchange for true intimacy, body and blood, bread and wine, even still. It does not matter what you've brought into your marriage. It does not matter where you currently are in your marriage. The body and blood is available for you. I get that finger out when I'm serious. Did you notice it? I did notice that. Do you feel the intense? I do. Okay. <laughs> I'm so glad we're together. 
He gave it all, <laughs> hoping we would too. The new covenant, Jesus Christ, brings total healing and lasting freedom. It doesn't remember the old ways. It transforms. It renews. Communion covenant takes us back to what was, uh, takes us back to what was stolen and renews that sacred vow. Um, so what does healing through part three look like? Healing through part three means sharing in communion with your spouse. It's trading in your sin, deception, hiddenness, hurt, betrayal, it all for the new covenant life that was promised through Jesus, our rescue. Remembering and sharing communion with your spouse is an intimate weapon. Ugh. Because what, before I say this, remember what that, the feel of that upper room that night. Just remember the feel of it. And think about this. Remembering and sharing communion with your spouse is an intimate weapon of exchange that repairs a ruptured soul tie of three strands entangled. It restores the sacred vow of oneness in Christ and each other. You're taking it back. And you're going, I'm putting the blood and the body over everything between us, and we're taking it back. Um, invite Jesus to come close as you prepare the bread and juice together as two broken people trusting in the wholeness of one perfect body broken for that moment. That moment. Man, I love Jesus and his word. It's so good. Ugh. And then in, his, in the strength of his words, look at your spouse as you're exchanging communion and say, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. Despite all that we've brought to the table, despite everything that's down the road, I have earnestly desired to share this Passover cup with you, this Passover bread with you. Jesus is the better way. Part four, the grieving. The grieving. This is important. When we look at Jesus' final hours, he grieved. There was grieving. You can't just sweep it under the rug and pretend it never happened. We tried that. It does not work. Grieve it. So in Luke 22, this, this section is based on Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. Um, I'll skip down. It says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. If you're willing, remove it. I'm, I'm here with you, but this is hard. We see this is hard. This is grieving. Later it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. That's sorrow. And did you know that Gethsem Gethsemane, the, the place where he's grieving so hard, the, the Hebrew translation for that is oil press. Listen to this. Gethsemane, or oil press, in the Hebrew translation was a small olive grove at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It marked a place of deep sorrow for Jesus when he cried out to his father. Agony. So we've got the, this, the name, an oil press. Agony pressed in on the purity of of his sinless nature and spilled from his sweat like drops of blood, much like the crushing of olives through the press and process of rendering pure, clear oil. He, his sweat was like drops of blood because he was being pressed so hard by agony, but it rendered a clear, precious, pure oil that would cover over all that we've done all that we are and exchange it for all that he is and all that he had been pressed and crushed for. And in the midst of the crushing of the pressing, he prayed. He prayed as his dearest three disciples slept. He prayed in the face of imminent death. He prayed even as his betrayer was at hand. He prayed through the grieving. He didn't set up camp he didn't set up a camp of despair and hopelessness in that olive grove. He grieved with God and gave up his will in exchange for the fathers. He grieved with God. We can't grieve alone. Grieving alone keeps us in grieving. We set up a camp 
And then we bring resentment and bitterness into our marriage because we're still camping out in the grief and in the despair and in the hopelessness. You've, you cannot set up a camp after there's been a wrong in your marriage. you got to invite God into your pressing, into your crushing, into your Gethsemane, and then get out of there. <laughs> Don't stay there. Thank you. Before any great resurrection story can unfold, there has to be a greater dying that is necessary for the new thing to awaken in its fullness of life. But even before the death, there must be a desperate grieving, a sorrow that leads to total transportation because you have to move from sorrow to surrender. Because in the surrender, that's where new life has room to come up. So we move from from sorrow to surrender. Prayer is our sacred language of intimacy with the Father. Prayer. We see Jesus praying in his darkest hour. Prayer is the healing balm for anguish, betrayal, disappointment, resentment, guilt, shame, unmet expectations, fear, anxiety, depression, hurt. I mean, prayer is your weapon of intimate exchange with the Lord. When we confess, repent, and humble ourselves under the new covenant, we begin to walk in the resurrection power of true intimacy and freedom. When we confess, when we repent, and when we humble ourselves under the new covenant, Everything changes. It's why we take time to go to the garden and grieve so hard that our tears become an exchange for the blood. You grieve so hard that your tears become an exchange for the blood. We lean into Jesus and invite his spirit to do what only he can. And we walk out of every oil press crushed but not destroyed. And instead with the purity of a heart surrendered to new life. So what does healing through part four look like? Grieve. Grieve. Invite God into your grief and trade the suffering and sorrow for surrender. Then, as a symbolic act of healing, I'm very much into the acts. acts. Like, what can we do right now between me and you to restore intimacy? What can we do as acts of obedience to follow the life of Jesus Christ for our healing? So, out of... um, as a symbol, um, to coming out of the pressing, come out of the grieving with olive oil and anoint your spouse and your marriage bed with blessing, new life, and a new covenant in Jesus' name. Anoint your spouse. Bless it. Anoint that bed. Bless it. Start all over. In Exodus 27, (laughs) Moses instructs the Israelites to bring clear oil. This is back in the Old Testament, okay? Exodus 27, Moses instructs the Israelites to bring clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning outside the curtain that shielded or protected the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was a sacred relic kept inside the tabernacle, which was the actual dwelling place of God before Jesus as the new covenant sacrifice and reminder of God's sovereignty, power, his reign, his love. And because of Jesus, we have the ability to host his presence. So come under the new covenant mercy and renew a new way. Bring your clear oil out of the pressing, out of the grieving, and recognize that the curtain ripped from top to bottom the day Jesus took on death and gave his life to shield and protect us so that he could be the clear, pure oil that keeps our lamps burning in the light of a marriage consecrated and anointed in him. Part five, the forgiving. I'm going to speed things up a little bit. Okay. So, forgiving. Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. When Jesus was on the cross, the next step of his life moving toward new life, resurrected, he had to do some forgiving. But this is so good. In order to press on into your healing. I'm going to read, I'm going to, let me, I'm just going to read Hebrews um, 12, 4. 
You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for the vengeance, like the blood of Abel. Another translation says a blood that speaks a better word, a blood that speaks a better word. And we must guard ourselves from taking a posture of revenge behind curtains of self-protection. It's there where we seek the blood of our spouse for recompense instead of the blood of Jesus for reconciliation. Living under the new covenant of Jesus' mercy and sacrifice means walking and operating in the spirit of humility and forgiveness. Forgiveness is the breakthrough for healing. Unforgiveness is the barrier of long-term resentment and bitterness. So again, we look to King Jesus and we bless and not curse. Um, They know not what they do. Jesus, and this is so, this is so mind-blowing. On the cross, Jesus looked to his father, and he said, you do the forgiving. They don't know what they do. Father, you forgive them. He didn't say, I forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said, Father, you forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus handed his right to forgive or not to forgive over to God his father, knowing God's forgiveness brings true and everlasting healing and an eternity in heaven. It doesn't just stop right here on the earth. If I offer you forgiveness, this, that's where it stops. If I ask, Father, you forgive them, it doesn't stop with me. That has eternity implications. Jesus became the intercessor for his offender, contending for their forgiveness by asking God, his trusted Father, to do the forgiveness. So what does healing look like for part five? It's looking your spouse square in the eyes, coming face to face and saying, Father, you forgive him. Father, you forgive her. She didn't know what she was doing. Part six, the letting go. Uh, This is based on Luke 23, 44 through 49. Um, It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land. And until the ninth hour, while the sun's light faded, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, when Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the woman who had followed from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Um, Once the healing balm of forgiveness has um, been administered to the wounds of betrayal, we must put to death whatever belongs to the earthly nature. So once you've gotten up to this point, you've given them forgiveness, Put it to death. Put the thing to death. And since we have established that it is our great design to walk parallel to the life of Jesus, um, it's our responsibility to crucify the old thing. We cut through the patterns of um, beliefs, demonic agreements, and attachments to dig out the root of spiritual infection and bury its hold on our life. We must kill the secret place of hiddenness that has held our freedom hostage with shame and condemnation. This is all really good, but... um, (laughs) Okay. Uh, We take sin nature to the grave. Um, Yeah. We take sin nature to the grave in a prophetic offering that exchanges a life clothed in death where we ceremonially cleanse and purify by the blood of Jesus, which prepares us for new life in him. And so healing through part six, um, that just looks like coming parallel to his death and his burial by turning face-to-face with your spouse and declaring in unity God's power, his life-giving healing, and then end with the words of Christ. We put to death all that was to make space for all that is to come in the land of the living where we are whole and healed once and for all. Look at your spouse and say, it is finished. It's done. Isn't Jesus the greatest model? Part seven, the resurrecting. And this is where new life happens at the other end. 
And I really don't know if I need to go into all of what new life looks like, except for that here we are. <laughs> and um, new hope happens in a resurrected life. So a resurrected marriage carries the promise of forever. Jesus's resurrection was a powerful display of glory that boldly announced his authority over sin and death, and that still remains true for you today. So take hope in an awakened life. Invite and allow the Lord to truly be your portion, the center of it all. You are one thing and awaken to new life in him. You buried the old thing. Behold, the new has come. Arise and awaken. Um, so what does healing through part seven look like? Together with your spouse, revisit and declare 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 again because you're going to experience something different. You've gone through the grieving, the forgiveness, all the really hard things, and now you're like, new life. Springtime is here, and the winter has passed, and the rains have stopped. Um, new life is here. And so, um, and, I, and I wrote, declare the power of the resurrection over your marriage and do it loud enough to shake the gates of hell with an awakened life yes. and an awakened marriage in Jesus Christ. Yes. Scream it if you have to. Um, part eight, the awakening. And the awakening is, um, remember that communion is a place of true intimacy with Christ, and that took place in the upper room. And it's true intimacy, and true intimacy renews our sight and opens our eyes once and for all to recognize him. Around 40 days after the earth shook and the rock split with resurrection power, Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of his Father. The ascension is the final redemptive act of Jesus Christ's time on this earth as a man in human form. And by doing so, we have direct access to Father God and the hope for eternity with him through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. We are now awakened to a new life under the glory of the new covenant. And the ascension is associated with the coming of the Holy Spirit, who's called the helper in John 14, 25 through 26. Also, Eve is called the helper in Genesis 2, 18. God said, hey, Adam, you need a helper. And then up here in Luke, he says, oh, hey, world, you need a helper. So, under the old covenant of marriage, we were unable to experience everlasting freedom. We kept returning to old thought patterns, old behaviors, trying to lay them down on altars of shame and regret, hurt and mistrust, soul tied to covenant marked by everything that used to be than Jesus. Consecrating the glory and power of a new beginning starts with renewed intimacy, and renewed intimacy honors God and the marriage bed and makes it holy. So, under the new covenant and under your awakening... Get back to the marriage bed and make it holy. Yes. Invite King Jesus to sanctify your sex life and make it holy. You disrupted the, in, the physical intimacy. Make it holy again. Anoint that bed. Make it holy. <laughs> All right. I want to end with um, Song of Solomon 2.16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. <laughs> I've got this whole send-off, but um, we, have to, we have to enthrone Jesus first and make him the center of our marriages and crown him worthy of it all because he's our daily bread. Behold, the new has come. Jesus Christ, your rescue my rescue, our rescue. You want to quickly, how do you want to? Okay. He's your daily bread. You can wait for lunch. <laughs> Come to the table. Amen. So, Communion has, has become a, um, a much bigger part of our lives recently, um, and it was actually a part of our uh, rescue and the, the story that we told. Um, so we wanted to receive communion with you guys as a, a family right now. So you should have all received the little styrofoam wafer and <laughs> grape juice. 
if you want to get those out. I think um, for us and probably a lot of you, the, the act of receiving communion um, has probably gotten watered down in the past and maybe watered down right now for you because um, it's kind of a, a religious programmed thing that we just do and, and a lot of times don't, don't think about it, um, which is a travesty, I think, because it's, it's such a huge, powerful, and complex thing, um, just receiving the body and blood of Jesus. We could fill weeks of sermons going over it, and of course, we, we can't do that now, but um, I would say if, if when you receive communion, you're not greatly affected <laughs> and extremely humbled, and for me, a lot of times, a weepy mess, like, start researching the blood. Yes. Just start, just mm-hmm. look at all the references in the Bible to the blood. It's all throughout Scripture. It, from Genesis, it starts talking about Jesus and the blood. And it's all pointing forward to, to Jesus' blood. And then after Jesus was on the earth, everything after that points back to his blood. That's right. And we're still to this day, everything we do should be pointing back to the blood. Um, yeah, I've got more here than I should probably talk about. Um, but yeah, just talking about the foreshadowing of Jesus in the Old Testament, um, we see it in the Passover story in Exodus, um, where in, in Egypt, the first, firstborn of each family were going to be killed, and so the Israelites, in order to, to save and protect their families, they would, they would mark their doors um, with the blood of a spotless lamb. And that's a foreshadowing of, of Jesus as the, the final and ultimate sacrifice. Um, but it's also kind of a foreshadowing of us today applying the blood of Jesus over our families. Um, and that's what we do when we, when we receive communion. We're, we're applying the blood of Jesus mm. over us, over our families, over situations. It, it's... It's not for one thing. It, the, blood, the blood covers everything. It does so much more than we even comprehend. Um, yeah, and in, in Corinthians, Paul, um, Paul writes in there, I've got it somewhere, but he, he says, as often as you do it. Yeah. And so it's not once a month at church, you do this and remember me. It's as often as you do it. It means we can do it whenever we want, <laughs> whenever we need to. We can apply the blood <laughs> over a situation whenever we need to. And I think this needs to become a more common thing uh, for us. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to read through some of what Paul writes in Corinthians, and then we will take it. So Paul writes, can you open mine too? Yeah. Paul writes, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you guys can go ahead and take the, the bread. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So you can go ahead and take the juice.
And he said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we're proclaiming the Lord's death in this because his death is what sets us free. It's, it's what um, gives us salvation. It's what adopts us into his family. Um, we can become his sons and daughters because of his death. So I just thank you, Jesus, for the blood and for your body um, that you gave for us. And that um, just brings us into your family that completely changes our bloodline and that gives us an inheritance from you. And God, just help us to um, apply your blood in our lives and over our families and in our situations. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I, I talked about as often as you do this, and you can do this anywhere. In the Passover story, actually, the, the head of the household is the one that applied the blood over, mm. over their door. So I just challenge the men here to start doing this with your family. Just get your family together at home and take communion and just apply the blood over, over your wife and your kids. Yeah. I think it'll be a, a powerful thing. Yeah.